Welcome back to Crime After Crime. I'm John Lorden. And I am Danielle Hallen. And we are here to announce, Danielle, that the jury for our last show at CrimeCon Orlando has been selected. We are officially out of seats for our final episode. Thank you guys so much. Now, we are so excited to hang out with the final jury, but if you are heartbroken, which I'm sure some of you may be, you didn't get in, do not worry. You can still come to CrimeCon and meet us, you guys. You can still come and have a good time. John and I will be working at our table throughout the entire weekend. Come and chat with us, get some free goodies, maybe take some pictures if you like. John always has the best things that he's handing out, so you do not want to miss our table. Yeah, yeah, definitely. <laughs> You'll be underwhelmed by my stickers, but it'll be fine. <laughs> you can... <laughs> You can still use our code to save on a standard crime con pass. Just use the code crime after crime with no spaces in the coupon field and you will save 10%. Yeah. And I think that's the only type of pass left. I think the other ones have all sold mm -hmm. out. I think all you can get is standard. So if you are, use that code, save 10%, come and say hi. And yeah, I'll give you something. We've got all kinds of free stuff we're going to be giving out. <laughs> uh, all right. It is time to see what happened with the results for our last episode, Crime and AI the pros and the cons. Now, Danielle told us about the cons, including a story where systems that can detect gunshots in cities were used to finger the wrong man. Terrible, terrible story. Yeah. I highlighted the pros of how AI can help law enforcement if used responsibly, which we certainly touched on a lot around those topics. And I also shared the story that ChatGPT thinks is AI's biggest success in fighting crime so far, solving the murder of a teenager using social media information to find her online groomer and landing him in prison for 50 years. How did it all play out, Daniel? All right, you guys. So on the Twitter poll, I received 61% of the votes and John received 39. Congratulations. And then on the website poll, I received 54% and John received 46. So I get to keep the mug. You get to keep the mug and pretty close, pretty close. But I knew yeah. I, I had an uphill battle with the side that I was taking because people have been scared of technology for so long. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just it's a hard argument to make. Um, also, I'm wondering, Danielle, if maybe the audience has heard that you know, I'm, I've gotten into this pattern of intimidating you before we actually record and they're they're kind of lashing back against me. So can can we just clarify, uh, have I intimidated you at all about today's story? Surprisingly, no. OK, OK, so I, I, <laughs> I'm I, serious. I, you have not. Okay. You have not. Good. Good. All right. Just wanted to point that out for anyone out there that and, <laughs> maybe that vote was kind of sitting on the fence. I look, I'm not I did not intimidate her about today's story. I didn't tell her about how I know I've got the best story. Of course not. Usually he's sending me emails ahead of time. <laughs> hey, the thing is, is he doesn't even intimidate me. He sends me like a very kind, just like email, let me know what a story is. And then I freak myself out. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Speak softly, but carry a big stick. Yeah, uh, see? Today we are looking to the skies for crimes committed on airplanes and we're not just talking about a woman screaming that a man in the back of the plane isn't really a person, which I'm still mm. wondering about. What the heck happened yeah, around that? Yeah, all the time. Uh, I have no idea. We're digging into some of the craziest airplane crimes that we can find. And actually, a story like that can be a criminal act. It is a crime to cause a disturbance on an airplane if the offender interferes with the duties of crew members. I feel like we've already had a few stories that are similar to that. Mm -hmm. And it's... A federal crime, by the way. So the FBI proudly states on their website that they investigate crimes committed aboard aircraft, including assault, theft, interference with flight crew members, or even sexual misconduct. Hear that, people? Mm -hmm. Trying to join the Mile High Club might even get you a visit from Agent No-No Square. Don't do yep. it. They also investigate some violations at airports, including violence and interfering with security screening personnel. But... There apparently is no criminal trend of people trying to join the we had sex in an airport club because I'm not finding oh, anything on that, Danielle. Oh, yeah. They're waiting to get on the planes, apparently. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> Justia.com notes that the most serious aviation crimes involve piracy, which I feel like comes as no surprise, which basically means that someone violently seizes control of a plane in flight. So all of our worst fears, essentially. Mm, a lot of possibilities for today's cases. Please put your tray tables in the upright position as we get started with an airplane crime story told by the amazing Danielle Hallen. All right, you guys, buckle in. Now, some people, <clears throat> possibly like myself, you have to bribe to get on an airplane. <laughs> oh, I didn't know this. Out of you. fear. Yes, okay. it's a thing. While others, I feel like, have dreams their whole lives to travel the world and would hop on one in a heartbeat. But for some, like Marilyn Hartman, hopping on planes is not a way to travel off to a fun destination or even really necessarily a place of fear. But it's actually a way to escape those trying to take you down when you're part of a massive whistleblowing conspiracy plot that the FBI is trying to take down. Ooh, hello. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Went from zero to 100 real quick. Everyone has their, their yeah. reasons for it. <laughs> well, and twisted my brain a little bit because if it's a whistleblowing plot, it means there's someone that are trying to usually yeah. help the government come to understand that there's some crime that's going on in an organization or something. So. Why Don't worry, FBI? much of this won't make any sense. <laughs> okay, okay. Yeah, I'm already twisty. <laughs> so 66-year-old Marilyn's name flooded the headlines back in 2018. She had managed to sneak onto a British Airways flight from Chicago O'Hare International Airport all the way to London Heathrow. This is a flight that costs around, I believe it was like $2,400 at the time. Woo. And no, oh, oh, I know. <laughs> she wasn't stuffed into a carry-on or hiding in the landing gear compartment, which, by the way, why are there so many stories of people doing yeah. both of those things? Instead, this woman had simply walked onto the plane without a ticket, taken a seat, and enjoyed the flight, no questions asked. That is until she was faced with customs when she got there, who was shocked that this woman had traveled so far without a ticket or a passport. And so they're not sure what to do, so they just turn her around and send her back to Chicago. Now, this is an age where airport security is at its highest. Yeah. We all know that. Yeah. And nobody could figure out how she managed to pull this off. Marilyn was this elderly homeless woman that looked frail and sweet and like everyone's grandmother, right? And so Chicago authorities are dumbfounded and they arrested Marilyn the moment she arrived back to the States and she faced charges of felony theft along with trespassing. And they frantically tried to get to the bottom of how she accomplished what she did so they could patch up the very obvious holes in security. And the ease in which Marilyn hopped on a plane with no documentation blew everyone's minds. So when they started looking into this, authorities found that on January 14th that year at around 2 p.m., Marilyn just casually strolls into O'Hare Airport. She didn't pull out forged tickets or anything like that that you would think she could use to trick her way onto the plane. Instead, she waited in line like everyone else and then managed to slip past two TSA agents by simply blending in with the crowd and hiding her face with her hair. Uh, yeah, I was going to say, like, you can't even get in the airport. It's not like the old days where, yeah. like, Danielle, I used to go hang out at airports. Yeah, like you could yeah. you could have gone to hang out at the airport previously. Like you could go. Mm -hmm. There was no security checkpoints before all the stores and bars and all that stuff. Like you could go shopping and do all that Free stuff. Free for all, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you can't even get into the airport without a ticket. But she just covered her face with her hair. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just covered her face with her hair, blended right on in. Something so simple, but apparently very, very successful. <laughs> but multiple checkpoints too. Like you got uh -huh. to get... I mean, there's usually a person at the start of the security line. Yep. You get the actual person um, checking the IDs mm -hmm. and tickets. And that checkpoint is pretty strong because that person, it's a bit different getting around a TSA agent that's kind yeah. of at the front of the line. Like maybe you can kind of duck under a rope like over on the side of the line or something but the official agent that's always behind the glass that actually takes yep. your ID and scans it or runs the light over it. How the heck did she get past that person? That's what I'm saying. Apparently just by smiling. Wow. <laughs> so now security footage showed that initially she had planned to only hop on a domestic flight to Connecticut. And so they see her move through this airport and she ends up stopped and being questioned. And so clearly she realized in this moment she needed to revise her plan. So before raising too many alarm bells, she takes off running to another area of the large airport where she could be seen literally hiding out until the following day <laughs> and apparently plotting 
her next move, right? Okay. Which included a pretty drastic change and a massive risk, which was tossing her plans to fly domestic and flying all the way to London. Why not? Now, exactly. But at this point, she somehow had a lot of things that she had to get through, and she did it. She had to snake her way through customs at this point. She was screened at a, yet another security checkpoint before even getting on the flight. She could be seen literally smiling her way through this whole entire thing. And they just let her on. <laughs> she then goes and hides in the bathroom in the back of the airplane until everyone boarded, and she was able to wander off to an empty seat where she enjoyed the rest of her flight. Now, shocked, TSA immediately is like, we got to review our security practices here because yeah. she just made it through so many different checkpoints. How could this elderly woman accomplish something so unbelievable? She had shown no ticket, no ID, no passport, and slid through as if she had every single one of them readily available. Danielle, is she walking up to each of these checkpoints going, no English, no, no, no. English? <laughs> well... <laughs> Maybe something a little similar to that. Okay, okay. But as they're digging into how this woman managed to do this, you know, again, this is 2018. They're like, this isn't making sense. They start looking into her history and they're like, oh no, this is not the first time she's done this. She had done this dozens of times before, and this wasn't even the first time she had successfully flown overseas without a ticket. What? And somehow nothing had been done about it. Because the truth behind it all is that Marilyn had been sneaking onto planes by her own account since 2002. <gasps> She's a pro. Wow. 16 years of yes. free flights. Yes. Wow. And most of those instances went completely unnoticed by authorities until her first documented incident in 2009. And so she's being shown for years like she can get away with it. So no wonder she's like such a professional. Yeah. <laughs> so they started looking back into the history. Now, the first documented incident in 2009, Marilyn was apparently attempting to fly out of Hawaii, which, by the way, who knows how she got there to begin with. Mm -hmm. I've got my guesses. But instead of simply sneaking onto the plane, she decided, all right, I'm going to do things a little different this time and tried to use someone else's boarding pass. Now, this did not go well for her. It was ultimately her downfall. The scheme failed and led to her arrest for the first time doing one of these plots of hers. Um, and this led to also a bout of silence in her travels. Facing the law, Marilyn at this point claimed that she could explain why she did what she did, that this is nothing she had done before, which we know is not true. Basically, she said, look, I had to get off the island. It was an emergency. This was the only way to do it. But I promise I will not do it again. Mm -hmm. But despite her promise, in 2014, she was back at it again. Yeah. In August of 2014, San Francisco airport security and employees became very well aware of 62-year-old Marilyn. She was a frequent visitor of the airport, and they're all looking at her and thinking she's just this older woman that was very obviously lonely. And so they indulged her in conversations about traveling. And she's like, oh, I want to go to Hawaii. It's a dream vacation of mine, despite her prior claims that she had to get off the island. And this time she was even telling an awful story to all of the staff about how she had recently been diagnosed with cancer and her dying wish was to spend her last few days in the sun. Wow. But when it came down to it, Marilyn never had a ticket for this trip that she kept speaking of. And it almost became this like laughable joke that this woman was innocently trying to go on a trip of a lifetime. But behind that sweet, confused smile, Marilyn had a plan up her sleeve because she's sweet talking all the staff and this, that and the other. And in between all of those times, she had tried to successfully get through security to go to some plane heading to Hawaii. Didn't matter to her which one. And also between these conversations, she had made three separate attempts to board other planes without a ticket at surrounding airports. Wow. So she's just from every angle, she's just getting them. And two out of three of those times, she successfully had managed to bypass a document checker and get all the way to the boarding area before being caught. Just to do that. Mm -hmm. Because if you get that far, then honestly, I'm kind of surprised she didn't roll back to her earlier method. Because if you get past mm -hmm. the document check, um, I know on most of the flights I go on now, there is no ID check that happens on, in the boarding process. Yeah. So if someone, if you could swipe yep. someone's ticket, if you get over there and you would have to have them somehow distracted or, you know, 
Mm -hmm. because they're going to go up when the flight's boarding and they're going to be like, oh, I lost my ticket, but I'm on this flight. What seat were you in? Like it it might shake out. But um, yeah, to get past the document check process is probably the hardest part of it Um, because (laughs) yeah, even with, you know, especially during boarding, if, if the flight's a little late or something like that, I see that things get pretty sloppy. And yeah, exactly. You might have one person that has like three of the tickets for their family. And if you kind of fall in behind them, you act like you're the grandma, you know, point at them as you're going through, like, which is what she was doing most of the time. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. So she was finding she families was... and then just acting like she was grandma at the back yeah, of the pack. She was just yeah. the confused grandma. <laughs> right. Right. No English. Cancer. Exactly. No English. Exactly. Yeah. Wow. Wow. And so she had successfully done this. She was caught every single time. But I mean, each right. time she got a little bit further. And so it was so astonishing that the airports even evaluated their document checkers. Wow. Because <laughs> they're like, is our like equipment faulty? What's going on here? They don't want anyone to pull something like this, you know, off again. Yeah. But even in those circumstances where she had been taken multiple times, she clearly had a history of being on airplanes at this point since 2009. Um, that sweet facade, man, it was just winning people over. That's just sweet little old grandma. And so when she would end up with charges, they were usually dropped. Ultimately, she was sent to like social services to assist, get her in some sort of like home. Um, you know, she they believe she was dealing with mental health struggles. So she went to a few places like that. But on August 4th, 2014, she just continued on her plans. None of these things they were doing was stopping her. She obviously had a desire to get on out of there. Now, on this particular day, Marilyn arrived at San Jose International Airport, and those two successful attempts at bypassing a document checker, she took all that into account, and she got into the airport, no boarding pass in hand, and managed to successfully hop on a Southwest Airlines flight to LAX with nobody batting an eye. Well, Southwest is also the easiest way to do that because they don't have um, assigned seating. It's all just first come, first serve seating. But right. but if the flight's full, which it usually is with Southwest, they'd probably notice like, hey, there's one person that doesn't have a seat. Oh, and that may kind of be what happened because once they landed in LAX, the crew was performing a typical head count. Yeah. And they're like, hmm, we seem to have one extra person. And this led them straight to Maryland. She didn't have a ticket. She had nothing to show. And so she was arrested for misdemeanor trespassing. But the judge, once again, was like, oh, this is just an innocent, elderly, confused woman. And so he let her off with just <laughs> probation. Just probation. And do you know where she went the following day? Southwest Airlines. Come on. LAX, duh. Yeah. Back, and <laughs> go back, back for Southwest. There. Listen, <laughs> Southwest Airport. <laughs> Southwest Airlines is depending on a process that school bus drivers use. Yeah. Yeah. Like they're counting heads. Oh, wait. Mm-mm-mm. Mm-mm. <laughs> it worked out great for her. I know. And There's, I'm like, how? Oh, one of you doesn't have a buddy. Where? Who's yeah. using the buddy system in here? Mm-hmm. Like Southwest. We could, we could do better than that. I know you don't want to oh, assign exactly. your seats, but man. They're doing a manual head count. Exactly. I know. And well, it doesn't help either when the judge is like, eh, I know she has a huge history of yeah. doing this, but we're just going to give her probation. And so the next day she wakes up, she's like, ha ha. Seriously. Off to the airport I go. Yeah. And she's literally found wandering from terminal to terminal. <laughs> she's just picking which flight she wants to hop on that day. And so she was again arrested. And this time they're like, you know what? We've tried. You're going to be sentenced to 177 days in jail. Like you got to, you got to get some time here. Right. Well, and Danielle, you want to know how fast she got out? Oh no. Two days. (laughs) Three days. Oh my God. (laughs) Due to overcrowding and the fact that she was, you know, up there in age, they're like, "Mm." yeah. You but, can go on and go. Well, how does this play out though? Like let's let's assume she gets her free flight. Yeah. She winds up in Hawaii or something. Mm-hmm. Does she then take out her charge card and she's like, oh, okay, now I'm gonna get a hotel? Well, she's homeless, so I don't think she really cares where she stays as long. I mean, she doesn't oh, care so what the destination is and what happens when she gets there. She's she, just as going. She'll just find a restaurant to sleep behind or something. Like Yeah. Wow. Wow. Oh yeah. So she's released within three days this time. And over the next month, she was kicked out repeatedly of Phoenix Airport. And authorities are like, wait a minute. How did you get to Phoenix? Oh, no. 
<laughs> so they're meticulously going through flight logs, trying to find what plane she stowed away on. And they're just coming up empty handed. She's like untraceable how she's doing this. It's like a ghost. She's just smoke <laughs> and mirrors. And at this point, her shenanigans had caught the attention of the media because, again, she's been arrested multiple times now in uh, Phoenix. And they wanted to hear her side of the story. And it wasn't like a huge news thing because the news really wasn't picking up on it too much. It wasn't all that interesting until all the pieces came together. Right. But what she said, absolutely wild. So Marilyn is like, look, I'm not at all to blame here for the fact that I can get onto these airplanes without a ticket. The government needs to be answering how on earth they allowed me to get past so many security checkpoints so many times. She's like, why don't you ask them why why I got on the airplane? And not just that, but she's like, you know, and also why I do this, I have an unrecognized mental illness called whistleblower trauma syndrome. Okay. And she's like, this mental illness puts me into a literal fight or flight. <laughs> That forces me to get on a plane and run away when I face trouble. Wow. Like she literally says she is this mental health disorder pushes her into this fight or flight. And she's like, it doesn't matter the flight. I just have to go. Right. And so like, okay, that doesn't sound legit. And so she's like, well, also to add to all this, the FBI got mad at me because I was a whistleblower. That's how I ended up with whistleblower trauma syndrome. She said that she did something about corruption and the FBI kicked her out of her home and forced her to be homeless. And that for years, she had apparently been a target of a giant government conspiracy due to this. And that some of the time she didn't even enter these flights illegally, but had mysterious strangers give her tickets. And she claimed that she would take these tickets and be like, hey, look, a free ride. Don't know where this came from, but I'm going to get on the plane anyway. And she said that the officials were specifically picked out to let her on the plane, knowing it was her, to then turn around and have her arrested. It was all just this big plot to take her down. Mm. So I just looked it up. There is whistleblower trauma syndrome. It's it's basically a, a syndrome that people go through that are legit whistleblowers, yeah. like after the fact that, you know, yeah. there's, there's a, a psychological reflex mm -hmm. to what they're going through and that people are going to be coming after them. They've got, you know, depression issues, uh, even thoughts of, of harm. So, um, and that's what she, that's what she's saying that she had. Did they confirm her w whistleblowing instance though? No. Mm -mm. Okay. No. Okay. None of that was confirmed. And at the time this was happening, it was not a recognized mental illness. Yeah. Man. And so they're like, wow, we were not expecting that. That's a wild explanation. Um, and she just continued bypassing security and taking flights to all sorts of destinations. And at this point, they're like, how do we stop this woman? They put her photo all throughout TSA at multiple airports, hoping that they could stop her before she got through security. But she still just kept on going. In February of 2015, she somehow made her way to Minnesota. Again, no one knows how she got there. But when she was there, she boarded a flight to head to Florida. And at this point, she's like, you know what? I'm going to step things up a notch. And after landing in Jacksonville, she took on an entirely new identity. Someone came up to her and was like, are you Maria Sandgren? Like, it was like a driver. And she's like, why, yes. Wow. <laughs> yes, I am. And they take her to the Omni Resort. And she spends time there, $300 a night hotel, all these amenities, until the real Maria shows up absolutely infuriated and Marilyn flees. <laughs> She's just going for it. She's milking it for everything she can. Yeah. And ultimately, authorities caught up to her, arrested her, and charged her with fraud and trespassing. And at this point, she was finally placed on file as a, quote, serial stowaway. Hmm. Hmm. Well, and, and now, was... now there's damages, too, because now she's oh, used yeah. services. I mean, she has been using mm -hmm. services all along the way where people pay money. Yep. But especially that one, like the identity theft twist, mm -hmm. that's that's a bit of a change in, in the story. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, Marilyn ended up serving a year for those crimes and then was taken back to Chicago where she went into a mental health facility. And they were like, OK, look. <laughs> We don't know how to keep her off of airplanes that she shouldn't be on. And so hopefully this will have her constantly monitored. If she is dealing with mental health struggles, they can be treated and, you know, we can try to get her to a better place. And she, of course, was promising for the umpteenth time that she would not reoffend, But she did anyway. She snuck out of her home and that is when she took her trip to London. Mm. Now, Marilyn was 
it was tricky though. Like if you look at it from a legal standpoint, even the judge was like, she's not like planning to go on a specific flight. She's not posing a danger to herself or anyone else. Like she's literally just hopping on airplanes, like whatever plane she walks up to and just fly into wherever it's going to take her. And they're like, you know, even half the time when she does get charges, she gets a psyche valve and the psyche valve says that she's unfit to proceed. And so there were like only so many things they could do. So the judge is like, I'm just going to give you 18 months of probation to keep a closer eye on you. And again, suggest mental health counseling. Um, Cause they're like, at least if we can keep tabs on her through probation or something, yeah. she won't attempt to leave the country on a flight again. Well, I was going to say like, can, can we get a monitor on her, like an ankle monitor during her probation period and, mm. you know, set up a geofence so that if she gets no, close to airports, text someone do you think that she would care just curious no she she would go do it anyway but at least then Absolutely. they would know <laughs> yeah and they know where during probation in 2019 she was back at o'hare yeah yeah like literally almost immediately but thankfully the list that she had been put on the photos of her plastered in airports it finally worked like the tsa there's a whole article on it they were like talking to each other they're like we've got a maryland sighting <laughs> <laughs> Like code people Maryland. know this old lady. Co code, exactly. Code like, Maryland. Yeah. And she was located, arrested, and they're like, we are trying to help you. Yeah. <laughs> but now you're going back in Cook County Jail for violating your probation. But you can't knock this woman down because she's supposed to be in jail, right? Except the pandemic hit. And oh. so for, to prevent transmission, she was released. Wow. Wow. <laughs> well, at but least at that what? point, the flight slowed down. <laughs> And Maybe. she also was given an ankle monitor. Oh, okay. All right. There and they're like, look, we're going to get you. But Marilyn doesn't care. Even with an electronic monitor and a whole pandemic, she was multiple times found trying to make it through airport security. Well, yeah, but with an ankle monitor, I would think her being it detected. Well, I don't know if it would make an audible alert, but even if it didn't, um, she now has a, an item on her that I would think metal detectors would be sensitive to. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And she was going with the ankle monitor on and it was it was being found. It was beeping. So, like it, you know, electronic. a trained security person seeing an ankle monitor coming through their system mm -hmm. is probably going to maybe be a little more diligent about checking the ID and the ticket. Yeah. Which they did. And she immediately was turned around because you yeah. guessed it. She didn't have either of those. Okay. <laughs> but she was still trying. It's wow. Why not? A for effort, it's right? It's her game. Exactly. It's like the game of her life. Yeah. It's having the the most fun. Some people watch Until... prices right. Other people Some... <laughs> go for free flights. I was about to say you have your like dream when you're older to just get in really low speed accidents. Yes. This is going to be me. It's similar. I'm just going yeah. to be repeatedly trying to get into airports. Yeah, why not? <laughs> oh, but in 2022 all of her, you know, shenanigans came to an end because she ended up facing felony trespass and escape from electronic monitoring charges mm. because she was like, man, this ankle monitor keeps tripping me up. Yeah. <laughs> Got to get rid of it. And she ended up being sentenced to two years and 18 months in prison, which explains why there have been no more attempts because she's currently in prison so far, unless they release her sometime soon for some other bizarre thing. Yeah. But once she was finally arrested, she started to claim, you know what? I'm done for real this time and even started to divulge some of her secrets because it almost became this like how is she doing it yeah like how is she doing it why is she doing it because everyone's like well clearly she's like mentally unwell but other people are like mm, i don't know about that like yeah. i've got other questions and so she said in an interview quote i have never been able to board a plane by myself i was always let through I got by them. And that's the thing that's so crazy by following someone. She basically goes on to explain in all these interviews that she would just act confused, cling to a group of people, and people won't question a thing. She's like, if right. you just smile at them and say yes, yeah. that's how I got through. That's how she ended up at the Omni Resort was just by smiling and saying yes. And she was like, and by the way, like, She's like, I first started this in 2002. And at this point, no one even knew that. She's like, in 2002, I got on an airplane to Copenhagen. That's crazy. She's like, I had a great time. The year after that, I flew to Paris. <laughs> I mean, Danielle, we're talking post 9-11. Yes. That's exactly. insane. 
And that's why everyone was so like, how on earth? Because, and they're like, it's working in her favor that she's not going in there by storm. Or like, you know, they're like, she's literally using everything she has to work in her favor. And she even said, she was like, the police would love to blame this all on mental health. But the truth is that she is, quote, really good at it. Yeah. Yeah. And the flexibility, I think. I think she, exactly. you know, she doesn't have a plan of like, oh, I have to get on a plane that's taking yeah. me to London. She just has a plan of I'm going to the airport and I'm going to find yeah. the situation <laughs> that takes me to the next place. And we're just going to go yeah. from there. Yeah. Every single time. And the it was she said that she had successfully gotten onto 30 flights. 30 at least. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. That's nutsy. Yeah. That's craziness. Huge thank you to NBCnews.com, Chicago Tribune, Wikipedia, NBS Bay Area News, and The Guardian. Think about that. We'll Danielle. see if she does it more. <laughs> She's getting free peanuts, free soda, yeah. free coffee. Mm-hmm. Like it's it's a way of living. That's amazing. She's just loving it. Yeah. And it's scary. Like I, even when I go to the airport to get on a plane, like having all my documentation and knowing very well that I paid to be on that flight, I still am like terrified. <laughs> right. But right. it's like after 9-11, like that's what I grew up at with as a child. Like I hadn't even been on an airplane yet. And then 9-11 happened. And after that, it was like everything was so scary when it came to an airport. So that's all that I have ever known. Yeah. Yeah. Well, imagine, I mean, it wasn't that long ago that you could take flights without even having an ID. That's crazy. Like, I'm, have you covered the DB Cooper story? Mm-hmm. Yeah. You and know. The people, well, you, you and would walk was, in. It would be like buying a bus yeah. ticket. You just write, yeah. write your own name on there. You yep. pay like thirty bucks, and okay, mm-hmm. I'm getting on this plane. Well, and in a lot of the different articles, it was talking about how that was. I forgot the name of it, but it was like a big thing for teenagers to do and college kids. Yeah. Where, like, they would sneak their friends on a flight and, like, nothing was in place. Yeah, yeah. Like, and no one noticed. It was just, it wasn't a big, it was, I mean, it was a big deal because they didn't pay for it. But, like, it wasn't now where you'd get, like, tackled to the ground. Right, (laughs) right. And, like, oh, man. So, um, are you going to try it out for getting a crime con? I might. (laughs) Look, no, I am too, like I just said, I am too scared of airplanes and airports. And I'm a rule follower. We've already determined that's, this. That's very true. That's very I true. I would probably end up like turning myself in. Like I'd walk into the airport doors and be like, I'm sorry, I did it. Danielle, it could make <laughs> for a good YouTube channel though. Oh my gosh. You're just going from airport to airport, seeing whatever you can do, where you can go, what free things you can get. Uh, oh man. I have recently kind of fallen in love with a show called, I think it's called Extreme Cheapskates. Oh, I feel like I've seen a few of the episodes. Yeah. And they're people that do really, really bizarre yeah. things because they yeah. think it's going to save them money. But there's this mm-hmm. weird level that they keep going to in that where it's like almost practically robbery. It, like if they can, if they yeah, can get something for free in some way, that's the biggest hit for them. Like there's mm-hmm. a guy that'll go to a supermarket and look for intentionally expired things and then take them up to the front and be like, oh, they're all expired. Can I buy these for 99 cents each instead of $10? Oh, wow. Um, but it's weird to see that line. Like for some people, it's just mm-hmm. the thrill of something for free is it's like winning the lottery or like winning a game show. The, literally, she's done this so much. This is a game. Mm-hmm. Oh, it, yeah. And it's a game she's winning. Oh, Absolutely. I mean, even all the times that she was caught. Yeah. What's the big what deal? Happened? Yeah. <laughs> like, they, they gave her a bed to sleep in and they like, fed oh, her. Like, honey. It's okay. <laughs> right. And she's probably like, ha. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'm going to France. Exactly. Oh, I mean, goodness. It, goodness. As soon as she would be released from some places, she's like, well, first stop. <laughs> Back to the airport. <laughs> Ridiculous. Yeah, I need some peanuts. All right, Danielle. Wow. Well, you have given us a good one to start off today's episode. I will never forget that story. Um, What can I bring to the fold? We're going to find out Mm. right after these messages. All right. Welcome back. It's time for John's airplane crime story. And honestly, I'm pretty excited because I actually struggled a lot with the research (laughs) on this one. And I kind of wish mine was more like a crime that happened directly on a plane, like something wild. Hmm. 
Hmm. Just something like more tied to an airplane than just like. Okay. And I feel like I feel like that may be the kind of story you're bringing. Uh, this you might be right. I might be able to to fill that need for this episode. Let's talk a little bit more about planes and something a little bit bizarre. This is a story, Danielle, that I like to call Larry wants his own. Oh no. Now you know. In five years, we've had many, many interesting characters on this show, Danielle. Uh, but yeah. this this guy, he gives Florida Man. If Florida Man was one person that did all those things that Florida Man is known for, this guy would still give him a run for his money. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. We're going into a story that the Chicago Sun-Times calls one of the most spectacular crimes of the 20th century. And... How a guy with a name that you probably don't recognize is actually tied to the history of crime on airplanes forever. In terms of technological advancement, air travel developed at a crazy speed. It was 1903 when the Wright brothers made a 12-second flight. And less than two years later, the first practical airplane was built by the Wright brothers. It was called the Flyer 3. A few years after that, there were airplanes being used in World War I. And on May 21st of 1927, Charles Lindbergh flew across the Atlantic Ocean, the first transatlantic flight landing in Paris, France. Keeps coming up in the stories today. <laughs> Soon there was a full-blown commercial airline industry transporting mail, packages, and people all over the U.S. and the world, even people without tickets, apparently. Mm-hmm. Uh, I imagine those early years of air travel must have just gripped the attention of many young children. And they certainly grabbed the attention of a young man named Ernest Pletch. Now, Ernest was born in 1910. So he was watching all these developments happen yeah. throughout his youth. And he wanted to fly literally more than anything else that he wanted in life. Now, Ernest, or Larry, as he was called by his family, which is apparently short for Ernest. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know that. Okay. His middle name is not... Danielle. You can call me Jim. <laughs> his middle name is not Lawrence. I think his middle initial is also P. I think it's it's Ernest P. Pletch, if I remember right. Um, yeah, no, but he goes by Larry. <laughs> And I kind of like it. I was about to say, I love this story already. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I also like it for a good reason. I'll save it for the end, though. Okay, so Larry was born into a pretty good situation. His father was a wealthy farmer, and Larry had actually been trying to talk his father into buying him an airplane. And as Larry got older, he seemed to have some pretty good mechanic skills. He even called himself an inventor. Although some accounts say that he was pretty much kind of a spoiled rich kid that avoided working around the farm by going and tinkering with things in the shed. But mm -hmm. Larry's father made him an offer. Graduate high school and he would buy Larry his own airplane. His own airplane, Danielle. Some people get cars. I guess some other kids get airplanes. Must be nice, huh? I was about to say that's like that's 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 pretty big. Yeah. Yeah. The only problem, Larry wasn't the most dedicated student. In 1926, he dropped out of school and he married a woman in what would be the first of several failed marriages. He worked odd jobs supporting himself. With his mechanic experience, I'm sure it wasn't hard to keep himself working, but at least yeah. one newspaper described him as being a farmhand at some point, which is all a bit of a strange turn for a man with a family that was going to buy him an airplane for graduating yeah. high school. Mm -hmm. But it seems that Larry actually pulled away from his family for a number of years and might have had some pretty strong feelings towards his father, who seemingly cut off his dream of flying by not buying yeah. him an airplane when he wanted one. Ugh, rude. Yeah. But Larry was determined. And around 1935, he studied all that he could about flying. And he did that primarily by reading like every book that he could get his hands on about it. A few years later, he landed what some might think would be his dream job. He worked at a traveling fair called Royal American Shows, and they had an airplane. Mm. They basically had pilots that would take people up for short, thrill-seeking rides. So you'd go and, 
hey, we're at this, you know, the traveling carnival's coming through. Oh, they have an airplane. And you buy your ticket, you go sit in the back seat, and they take you up for a little spin around, a little loop de loop. Absolutely not. <laughs> yeah, no, this was early days of aviation, man. Um, <laughs> now, I don't believe Larry was actually flying for them. I think he might have been a mechanic. It's finding the details on this is a little tough. Yeah. Um, other accounts I'm seeing are they just describe him as as being a carny basically, but uh, yeah. wh I do know that he at least was talking to the pilots about flying and he was learning more about it from them. Uh, we also do know that Royal American shows traveled 9 months out of the year all over the US and Canada. And Larry was basically just along for this ride learning as much as he could from the pilots. This Royal American show had like a train specifically for them that would go from place oh, wow. to place and it had i think at its peak it had like a hundred cars like this was a huge huge traveling circus so larry's string of failed relationships would continue uh reportedly in some part due to his adulterous ways seems like he was spending a little too much time around the girly shows that were part of the traveling circus as well yeah well that can, that can cause some problems for yeah. you yeah at the age of 28, he already had two, possibly three marriages. But we know that Larry's heart belonged to something other than women. Mm -hmm. And even the excitement of the traveling fair, his numerous flings, and him finally being close to airplanes just wasn't enough for Larry. He still wanted his own plane and to be at the controls of it. In June of 1938, at the age of 28, he decided to make that happen. Now, Danielle, do you think that he saved up enough money to buy his own? Highly, highly doubt that. No, no. <laughs> uh, do you think that he crawled back to daddy and begged for the plane that he was promised for graduating? I think it's a chance. I think it's more possible that he went and stole one. <laughs> Yeah, no, he didn't crawl back to daddy, and uh, your instincts are correct. At 3 o'clock <laughs> in the morning, he went and stole a plane. I knew it. <laughs> yeah. He would later say, it was the first time I had ever been at the controls. The boys said it couldn't be done. I took off in that plane at 3 o'clock in the morning and flew it to Danville, Illinois, and landed it in a seven-acre field. So his first time flying is him stealing a plane, and the pilots that he was buddies with the boy said it couldn't be done. Said it couldn't be done, but guess what? He did it. But, all right, so you stole a plane. What do you do now? Yeah, exactly. And now you're in the middle of a gigantic field. Kind of like the person in your story, Danielle. You just keep flying around. Oh, there we go. Yeah. So he went to Vernon, Illinois, and he started a little side business that wasn't so different from what the traveling fair did. He gave thrill rides as a freelance pilot. And this is my fear. See? Mm -mm. Yeah. In a stolen, <laughs> no. stolen plane, just hopping from field to field, set up a little sign. Thrill rides? Yeah. Those poor people. Mm -hmm. And now that he had his kind of main desire fulfilled, his focus turned back a little bit to women, especially oh when a 17-year-old girl named Goldie went for a ride in his plane and Larry fell for her. He told her that uh, he was only 24, but we know he was actually pushing 30 at this point. But uh, <laughs> Oh, man. Larry's a gem. That's the perfect age, right? 24. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dating a 17-year-old. So he whisks this 17-year-old away, just flies from place to place, but completely freaks out her parents. Like they paid for her to go take this, this airplane flight. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden, they're gone. Mm -hmm. And they don't come back. So while they're flying all over the state, landing from field to field, over the course of four days, Danielle. <laughs> oh my gosh. Is this kidnapping? I think I could add kidnapping. Yes, I feel like that's definitely kidnapping. He's trying to convince Goldie mm -hmm. this whole time to marry him. But... That went a little quick, but yeah, okay. <laughs> yeah, but she keeps refusing. So what, what does Larry do? He flew off. He flew away, leaving her sitting under a tree in a field, 167 miles away from her home. <laughs> that is absolutely ridiculous, John. 
You're kidding me. I am not. Like you kidding. hear all these stories of, you know, he left me by the side of the road. We got in an argument in the car. No, he straight up left her miles away and flew in off. In a field. <laughs> yeah. Here, you just sit under the tree. I'm just going to go check something in the plane real quick. I have a, a picnic that I made for us. I'm going to go get yeah. it out of the plane. I'll be Bye. right back. <laughs> it takes off. <laughs> So yeah, I'm that pretty sure girl. I'm pretty sure it would have been kidnapping charges, but basically yeah. uh her parents say that he treated her so well that they don't oh, no. want they don't want to press charges. Hmm. Yeah. But uh the police do still catch up with him because he is flying around in a stolen plane. So yeah, that's kind of a big problem. Yeah. And now he's kind of caught the attention of media. Um, so yeah, he's, he's charged for the theft of the plane. He's released on bail. He's got a pending court date coming up. That's probably going to land him in the slammer. Like what reason mm -hmm. are you going to come yeah. up with? Hey, I stole a plane. I flew around the state. I made money with it. Uh, the local papers were now referring to him as the flying Romeo when they were writing about <laughs> the case because of his story with Goldie. Uh, and I'm sure Larry was really thinking about trying to fly away from this pending court date. Oh, absolutely. If only he had an airplane of his own. What oh, do you no. what do you think he's gonna do now, Danielle? Oh I feel like he's I mean, I feel like he's gonna steal another one. He's gonna get an airplane somewhere. Mm. So he rejoins the Royal American shows. Which you're joking to me kind of sounds like a decent escape plan. I mean, Danielle, you know that I have that's worked, a great place to blend in. Yeah. And I've worked for a circus. Um, there's there's a few jobs that I've seen in my life where I'm like, if I ever commit a crime, this is the type of job I'm you I'm can go roll hide into. here. Yeah, because you'll yeah, never no find problem. Me. Right. And they're yeah. just traveling nine <laughs> months out of the year. Um, so it seems like it's a decent idea. But the show travels to Missouri and Larry meets another woman. So what does he do? He marries her. So we're now on wife, I don't know, four-ish something. And uh, then a few days later, she leaves him. Now, some speculate it's because he robbed her. I mean, that sounds like right on par. Sounds right. I can see that. Yeah. yeah. And he's probably, you know, I don't know, trying to steal things to figure mm -hmm. out how to get back to a plane. So ultimately, Larry winds up in Brookfield, Missouri, and maybe with some of the money he stole, I don't know this for fact, but he decides to take some flying lessons from a man named Carl Bivens. So Carl Bivens was a husband and a father of two, and he was giving flying lessons in a plane that he borrowed from a friend, legitimately borrowed, Daniel. I don't mean that he stole it from his friend. Like Carl, <laughs> Carl's friend knew that he had the plane. Okay, good. Um, it was a Taylor Club monoplane, and it's one of those two-seaters where basically there's a person that sits in front of the other. Yeah. Right? You're not sitting next to each other. You got one person that's right in front and then one person behind. And there's two sets of controls in both of those areas. So mm -hmm. if you're in the back, you can fly. If you're in the front, you can fly. Perfect for a lesson, right? Because you can just kind of mm -hmm. switch controls back and forth. So Larry took a few lessons with Carl and everything seemed to be going pretty well. Carl even talked about, hey, you know, this, you seem to be a natural at this. They arranged for a third lesson and they took off. About 40 minutes into the flight, at somewhere around 5,000 feet altitude, Larry pulls out a gun. And he shoots Carl Bivens twice from behind, killing him. Larry then takes control of the plane, and he lands it in a cow pasture. He dumps Carl's body after he steals his watch and cash, and he takes off again. And all this is happening only a week or two before his scheduled trial for the last plane that he stole. But Larry wasn't just any old plane thief anymore. He had just become the first person to murder someone on a flight. And it was also the first case of a hijacking or air piracy in U.S. history. Wow. I mean, he just did the whole thing. He did the he whole thing. He just said, I'm going for it. We don't even need the kidnapping of, of a 17-year-old charge. Yeah, seriously. Yeah. He's uh, got the rest of them covered. Yeah. Uh, a young reporter working in Kansas City named Walter Cronkite 
would write about Larry, giving him a new nickname, calling him the Mid-Air Murderer. So Larry da, da. now has his plane. What's he do? Flies it over to his parents' house. He doesn't land. Just circles around there for a little bit. According to comments he made later, he considered ending his own life by flying the plane into his father's barn. But he says, he says his words that he chickened out. So uh, he flies away. He lands in another field in another part of Indiana in an area called Clear Creek. I, I love how you could just fly around and just like, hey, yeah. is that a field down there? I'm just going to land, land over here. Real yeah. quick. <laughs> oh, I'm going to take off. I'm gonna... How How is he refueling? Like, I just. I... That's been my question this entire time. I mean, he keeps stealing. So I know he's getting money, but isn't there. I guess they don't have checks like, you know, any processes when you go to refuel of like, can we prove ownership not. of this plane before we refill it? No. Um, so he lands in this field, but he's noticed by a bunch of locals. And there's this whole kind of sub story here where there's these two kids playing on the farm and they love planes just as much as Larry does. And basically all of a sudden they hear this loud buzzing and they're like, what is that? And they look up and this plane's yellow. So this bright yellow plane is like closer to them Not than they've ever. <laughs> yeah, this this bright yellow plane is closer to them than they've ever been in terms of seeing a plane, and it lands in their neighbor's field. So they like run to their parents, mom, mom, we want to go touch the plane, we want to go talk to the pilot, and the parents are like, no, 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 no. But the town is quickly aware of like, oh, a yeah. plane has just landed here. What's that about? So um, he does get out of the plane. He talks to some locals where he's landed and he basically asks, Hey, where can I get some food? Like I'm, I'm hungry. So they direct him to Williams and Wampler general store. And this is one of those old small town general stores mm -hmm. where they've got a little restaurant area in the back. Um, but everyone's noticing something strange about Larry's clothes. His overalls have blood all over them. I was about to say, and that kind of like tight vicinity, I'm sure he's got blood everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. He was sitting right behind and the wind, you know, there's no closed cockpit. The wind mm -hmm. is blowing everything backwards. So uh, Larry basically comes up with a story mm -hmm. telling everyone, oh, I, I had a nosebleed from the altitude. So that's, yeah, it's his blood that's on him. Now. A local switchboard operator named Bertha Manor was listening to a football game on the radio. And during that game, there was an announcement about a man who was suspected of murder flying around in a stolen yellow airplane. She, being a switchboard operator, also heard the locals chatting about the plane. You know, back then, switchboards worked. There was like almost party lines like phone yeah. lines were not necessarily one-to-one -one calls so you'd be hearing all kinds of other stuff that was going on exactly on. and she was a switchboard operator so she was hearing all these bits of information so uh she basically put two and two together she might be a, a wonderful example of an early citizen detective like she exactly yeah she heard about the crime figured it out had the other information pulled it together she contacted the police uh the police called the general store and they asked Bill Wampler if the pilot was there. They did the whole, uh, hey, Bill, only respond to us with yes or no. Do you have a pilot there right now that showed up <laughs> in bloody clothes? <laughs> Bill's like, yes, yes, the guy's here. Uh, crap, yeah, he just walked in. <laughs> yeah, so uh, Larry was there and he was waiting on some burgers. And the deputy on the phone basically asked Bill to stall Larry. He was like, we, we just need you to keep him there. So Bill... Yeah moved the burgers that he was cooking over to the cooler end of the grill so it would take them longer to cook he was basically yeah. slowing down how fast they were going to cook and apparently it worked perfectly because larry is right in the middle of eating these burgers when all of a sudden state and local police just flood this location <laughs> and thankfully it ends without further violence larry had his pistol on him but thankfully hands it over he was handcuffed and he was taken away. Now, you know, I, we've we've kind of been hitting this and we know Larry loves flying and wanted his own plane, but is that really, like, is that all there is to this motive? It's, yeah, seriously, because yeah, it was pretty extreme. It's really extreme. And it's not exactly clear that the motive is, is that simple. 
uh, because Larry told a bunch of different stories about it. Now, I'm still of the mind that I, I think he was trying to steal it because he wanted to stay on the move and that he was yeah. going to avoid that court date and just kind of live mm -hmm. as a wanted person. Like, I think that's yep. where he was going. But he would say that uh, first he stole the plane because he wanted to test out a new high performance aviation fuel that he had invented. Because remember, he's an inventor. Mm. Yeah. Uh, then he changed the story a bit. He said, actually, he and Carl were supposed to fly to Mexico together to help test out his super fuel. But mid flight, Carl changed his mind and they began arguing. And mm. Carl, who was seated in the front, reportedly turned around and was wrestling with Larry. And the plane was going out of control. They were both going to die. Because Carl was yeah. wrestling with Larry. The only yeah. thing that Larry could do, Danielle, was shoot him twice so that Larry could regain control of the flight and save his own life. Mm -hmm. You know, the one very common thing in both of those stories that he told is he's trying to make himself look like a hero or like. Yeah. Yeah. Or at least there it's justifiable homicide, exactly. right? Yeah. Oh, my life was being threatened. We were about to die. I had to shoot him to save my own life. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a bunch of absolute baloney. I do too. Uh, <clears throat> there was another wrinkle in all this. Um, first of all, it's the first of that type of crime in the air. So l there's no yeah. legal statutes, like just all of that stuff is in this major flux but there was a really big wrinkle in that they weren't sure exactly what county he was flying over when the shooting occurred so oh, man yeah so there was some question about, about that where are they going to try this case what mm -hmm. what what court's county is going to get it so macon county claimed jurisdiction based on larry's confession basically they took his word for it and they said okay you yeah. said you shot him and you were here so we're going to take the case uh, and they were concerned that a lynching might happen because this was just a oh, huge public yeah. eruption. Uh, so they really, they ran it to the court, to the courts as fast as they could. Yeah. Uh, Larry actually shocked everybody by pleading guilty. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. And he told the court, I just don't know why I killed him, but I did. I mean, dang. Okay, then. Yeah. The victim's wife would ask that the court not sentence Larry to death, but instead give him life in prison as long as he would agree that he would never apply for parole. And Larry agreed to it. However, just when you think that he'd never touch another airplane, and now he supposedly has life in prison, his sentence was commuted twice. Why Why is everyone so nice to criminals, Danielle? We're, we're hearing that trend know. all the time on this show. He was released in 1957. Uh, Smithsonian Magazine and actually a fellow named Mike Dash History who wrote up just an amazing piece. Like mm -hmm. This guy is so good. Um, they spoke to an archivist trying to figure out why Larry was released. Exactly. And that person noted that overcrowding was a very serious issue in Missouri state prisons and it wasn't uncommon for those sentences to get reduced. So he would actually live a long life. He didn't die until June of 2001. And it looks like he did work for another airline-related business at some point. He loves airplanes. He once even said, quote, I would rather fly than eat. Of course, what he would do to fly put Larry in the history books. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Well, the books of terrible history about really bad people who we probably shouldn't honor or try to remember. And that's why, Danielle, I'm happy that his family made a decision so long ago. It's almost like they had a premonition. Exactly. To call yeah. him Larry. Because I don't think his real name should be remembered. Do you remember his real name? I sure don't. I don't either. I just remember some I just name. remember Larry. Some Larry. That's all. <laughs> So uh, special thanks, Smithsonian Magazine and Mike Dash History. I'm telling you, that writing was amazing. You guys uh, take a look for yourself. Um, a great job. And uh, also thank you, New York Times, Chicago Sun-Times, magbloom.com, medium.com, faa.gov, and Wikipedia for some other information that contributed to today's story. You know, <clears throat> I feel like that escalated quite quickly. Oh, yeah. 
Like it was very obvious from the get go, like you're a very intense person and you clearly love to fly airplanes and do this, that, and the other. But it was like, it's almost, it almost seems like he got this like high off of these very specific things. And it's like, he lost sight of everything else, right and wrong, you know, and just reality in general, when he became focused on those things, yeah. like the women and the airplanes. And, and but I believe him when he says he has no idea why he killed this guy. Yeah, I don't think he does. I think there's a really important and God, this would make a great uh, kind of the bones of a great script. I think there's yeah. something really important in understanding the, the psychology of what's happening between him Absolutely. and his father. Um, and mm -hmm. that kind of level of entitlement, like how entitled was he? Was he really like spoiled rich kid? Is that kind of part yeah. of where that's coming from? Um, and the tough relationship between him and his family, like how how does that motivate some of this? There's no explanation. I'm not saying it would explain it. I just mean in terms oh, of- Oh no, but it's super interesting to think about because if you think about someone that's you know being raised in a situation where they're not told no ever, right. there's typically an extreme reaction when they are finally told no, especially when they are like going into their adulthood yeah, you know, and if he had this relationship where he's used to getting what he wanted and he's promised all these things and realizes like, I'm not going to get these things. I have to do whatever I can. He's not going to know where to put a limit there. There's going to just be this total disconnect of like how far he can take things because there's never likely been a moment where it's like, you cannot do this. This is too much. This is that. Right. It's just a whole bunch of like giving, giving, giving. Well, and outside of that, keep in mind what what kind of lines up with that is this whole thought of what aviation was bringing because yeah. like to us for me as a kid watching star trek or something would be like a dream like oh i'm going to be in a spaceship and i'm going to yeah. go from place to place and i'm going to have all these adventures and different things are going to happen like back in the early 1900s what do you think they were thinking when all of a sudden there's exactly. this machine and you can fly anywhere and you know especially a kid you're not aware of what the other side of the world's like but you yeah. knew that if you could get an airplane of your own you could go have all these big adventures and all this so yeah and, yeah and if that's all your daydreams are and all you're planning for your future and then it doesn't pan out the right. way that someone promised you it would yeah yeah well he should have stuck in school he could have had his own. Yeah, exactly. But yeah. when you're in that kind of mindset, you know, you don't think you have you have to work hard to do anything. You're expecting right. other people to get get that and do that for you. So, right. Ugh. Oh, poor boy. Oh, so did I tell you, Larry? Larry, he, candidate for Florida man, the original candidate for Florida man. Even though he wasn't from Florida, yeah. just that type of personality, man. Kidnapping. Yeah, just literally doing whatever, whenever, just to do it. <laughs> kidnapping, murder, and hijack. Larry. The first. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. First. Well, as always, we do have a couple of extra stories to share with you guys. We're going to start it off with Danielle. You guys, I saw this story and I was like, you got to be joking. You got to be kidding me. Because I feel like when I was going into this research, I like kind of expected not different things, but I was expecting a little more and I kept running into the same alarming things over and over. And I was like, there cannot seriously be people out there doing this on a regular basis. And unfortunately, there is. So in 2016, a woman was attempting to take a flight from Istanbul to Paris where she lived. Why are we all back in Paris again? <laughs> Here we go. This is just. <laughs> but she apparently had just gone through the process of adopting a four year old child from Haiti. And she was excitedly bringing this child home and apparently so excited that she went through the whole adoption process and did not find it necessary to purchase a ticket for her child to be on the return flight home. What? Like, how do you go? Adopting a child is not an easy thing. This it, There's so much to it. There's so much you have to do. How do you just say, you know what? I'm going to go through all of this and then just not do this little last part. And so somehow... She pulled a Marilyn Hartman and managed to successfully get through security and customs with this child having no ticket, which is just an issue within itself or a passport. How old is but this child? But she was a four. Okay. Okay. I don't know. With it. Is huh. there a minimum age for having to, or, or an age where you don't have Two, to buy a ticket? So you can, I, I know that you can have a child in your lap until the age of two. Okay. Okay. But I, I can't remember if you have to technically buy a ticket for them still. Yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, don't know. think you do. But then 
I'm pretty sure you don't, I don't think you have to, um, but definitely for, yes, you have to buy a ticket. Um, but she was stopped before getting on the plane. They're like, wait a minute, this is a four-year-old child. You can't do this. And so her logical solution was like, you know what we're going to do to solve this problem. It's not, I'm going to go and buy myself, you know, or her a ticket, which, you know, would make sense. She said, no, instead I'm going to go and buy myself another ticket for a different flight and shove this poor newly adopted child into my baggage. No. No. Yeah. Put her right into the carry-on. Fit perfect. That is ridiculous. A kid that's just been adopted too. What a terrible thing to go through. Ima I imagine. Just no, like for a terrible. second. Oh. And so she gets onto the flight successfully this time with her child stuffed into her carry-on. And then like eventually like I think she let her out. And then put her under the seat where the luggage would go with like a blanket covering her. But it's a four-year-old. So guess what happened in the middle of the flight? I have to pee. <laughs> I have to go to the bathroom. And so another passenger noticed that this woman had literally stowed a little child underneath the seat, hiding under a blanket the whole flight. And it's like, wait a minute, where did that kid come from? And went and told flight attendants. Mm. And so once they arrived, she was obviously arrested because... <laughs> And like at that point, why didn't you just buy her a ticket? Why did you, why did you buy yourself a different ticket for a different flight? I think just to change the situation, just because she knew she had tipped off the staff there, which honestly, I think is a trend that happened in your story as well. I would bet that there yeah. was times where she would go and try a gate and there would be a bad Ooh. occurrence and she would just go, okay, not that flight. I'm going for a different yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think it was probably because she was worried that she had tipped off the crew for that particular flight already. How oh, absolutely crazy. That poor kid. Yeah. And that's the story. Danielle, what did you title that story when I asked you for a title? <laughs> luggage child. <laughs> <laughs> that's the story of luggage child. <laughs> John, you always have like the perfect names for your stories. And that's something that I've never done. And he'll like, no, I think that's perfect. Off the wall, I'll be like, hey, what's like a good title for this? And I have to think of one on a whim. And I you was like, oh, uh, lug luggage child. Luggage child. You nailed it. Oh, goodness. Um, well, Danielle, uh, I want to tell a little story about air marshals. Okay. So, you know, I imagine that being an air marshal could be a bit of a stressful job. I mean, you're responsible Absolutely. for the safety of hundreds of people on that plane. And all of us need our ways to unwind. But in 2015, a few air marshals would make a terrible mistake during one of their assignments to Europe. Uh -oh. da Danielle, did you know that prostitution is legal in Germany, Switzerland, Greece, Austria, and many other countries in Europe? Oh, wow. Yeah. So while it's not illegal, you know, if an air marshal wants to do that, um, mm -hmm. if you are looking to spend some time with that sort of activity and you might want to keep a keepsake of some kind, please be sure to not make it photos and videos that you're taking on your government issued cell phone. Oh, no. Yeah. Because not one, but two agents used their air marshal cell phones to do this. And apparently they sent the materials to each other. Hmm. I've got questions, but I do you know, too. I got is, lots of questions. Isn't that a little weird? <laughs> you see me? Dude, do you see that? <laughs> Check this out. Look what I did. Oh my gosh. Isn't that crazy? Yeah, that's crazy. Bro, bro. <laughs> Check this out. <laughs> send me mine, I'll send yours, I'll send you mine. Yeah. Well, this all got discovered, and this issue would actually be presented at a House Committee on Oversight and Government Reform hearing, but that oh, wasn't wow. the only improper behavior being discussed at that meeting. Apparently, some air marshals, which could be men, could be women, mm -hmm. were exchanging sexual favors with superiors to get assignments to destinations of their choosing. So yeah, if they want to go to Paris or, or go to France... They're little, just out there having a blast. Yeah, a little favor, and uh, that's the assignment you get. <laughs> um, yeah, so Air Marshals, I love knowing that you're providing safety to the citizens. I think it's yeah. very cool to have them undercover and be on the plane and be armed and all that mm -hmm. good stuff. Which, by the way, I had another story about an Air Marshal that left her gun in the bathroom. Oh, no. 
That's not good. Yeah, but uh, please keep it in your pants. Now, yes. ProPublica Pro, Pro filed a FOIA request for information about crimes conducted by air marshals. It took seven year, more than seven years for the FOIA request to be answered. And it showed 150 arrests of air marshals that occurred between 2002 to 2012. And those crimes didn't only include prostitution. There was fraud, assault, moving drugs, assisting in human trafficking, and even attempted murder. But they sent that FOIA request back with information that the publication didn't ask for. It was this whole oh, statement no. and analysis about the information from the TSA. And it said, the vast majority of federal air marshals are dedicated law enforcement professionals who conduct themselves in an exemplary manner. So there. It's just like anything. There's good and bad yeah. people in every job. Absolutely. But I can almost guarantee you it took seven years because they did not want that information. Seriously. And the funny thing is the guy, the um, journalist that wrote about that, he sent that FOIA request on his fourth day of working for that publication. And it took You're seven. Joking. No, it took seven and a half years <laughs> for him to be able to write that article. <laughs> oh, I absolutely love it. Yeah. Oh, I yeah. love I love that. That's hilarious. Oh. Great. They're just having the time of their life over there. Yeah. And well, I, I mean, makes sense. It, it's a very easy position to get away with a lot of things. Well, and you know, like I enjoy taking a flight like it's nice mm -hmm. to be able to have have a drink or two i would assume that while they're on duty they're not supposed to be drinking or anything yeah. like that um but uh you know sometimes they used to seat them in first class based on mm -hmm. what i understand and apparently now they actually seat them in the back of the plane more frequently like the very very back um, yeah. but you know being in first class even if you weren't able to drink at least you knew you were getting some good food you're lounging in a nice comfortable chair mm -hmm. you're reading a book i mean i'm sure you got to look around while you're reading but um yeah you know yeah no I, I think it's probably and how are you going to be supervised i mean i think that's the biggest exactly. challenge like how do you keep them supervised well you mm -hmm. can't outside of yeah you cannot at all yeah well i mean outside and i'm of, sure they realize it very quickly right right but the crew you know like if the crew sees something weird then mm -hmm. they can possibly help with that there was another occurrence where some for some reason and this happened here in minnesota uh, a flight came in, landed on the tarmac, and all of a sudden the pilot comes over the intercom and it, it just, it stopped on the tarmac. They It doesn't roll up to the gate. Mm -hmm. And the pilot's like, oh, the gate isn't ready. We got to wait here for a minute. All of a sudden, a minute later, police cars are all flying towards it from both sides. And the passengers oh are just gosh. like, what the, what the heck is going yeah, on? Yeah, what is going on? Four cops come on. They identify two passengers in uh, first class and they removed them. One of them had a gun on him. It was an air marshal. For some reason, the crew misidentified or didn't know that he was on the flight somehow, saw that he was carrying a weapon, called it in, and they did this whole <laughs> removal of him. The FBI was like, uh, we're going to investigate because we don't know why they didn't know that he was on there. Like, they're, they're supposed to be aware when there's an air marshal on Communication there. is key, man. <laughs> Oh my gosh. See, this is Yeah. Can't say I'm all too surprised. Well, <laughs> no, no one seems to be on the same page anymore. Right, right. Uh after this episode, I feel like I've taken a trip, that's for sure. Who is yeah. going to win this month, Danielle? I don't know. We're gonna see. Mm -hmm. We will see. Audience, you guys, you get to vote. We leave it in your hands. Who told the best? airplane crimes story and you can vote over at our twitter account or x now yeah it's mm -hmm. so silly like i don't i don't even yeah. know what to say <laughs> like it <laughs> like i can't say tweet me like tweet me here or oh i sent a tweet now what do i say i xed <laughs> i xed doesn't that sound like i just did some drugs or something oh, i know I'm, i, I totally to does not sound good <laughs> Maybe someone here can help guide us. Is there like a new thing that people are saying? If yeah. you know, let us know because I, I already feel like the old man in the group. So yeah, we don't now know I what really to say. do. X. I'm I'm X. <laughs> uh, anyway, head over to X uh, at Crime After Pod, and you can vote for the first seven days. Or you can also head over to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We also always have the link in the description box below. Or you can still click the little I in the top of the corner if you're watching us on YouTube. 
at crimeaftercrimepodcast.com, which I'm seriously considering rebranding and just calling it Y. Yeah. <laughs> Y.com. Uh, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to join our Patreon, and shop our Teespring store. And a massive, massive thank you to our patrons. Yes. You guys are sticking with us through to the end, and we honestly really appreciate it. You guys are still getting a bonus Patreon special segment monthly, plus our patrons get a personal shout out and upcoming Patreon special. That's right. Danielle, we only have two episodes left now. I know. The next episode is the last one that we're going to be recording here in this setup before our mm -hmm. big Florida finale. But the topic for that episode, I am super excited about. We're okay. doing food heists. This is going to be great. I feel like this is just made for us because if you follow us on our Patreon, nine times out of 10, we spend most of the time talking about food. We do talk about food. Yeah, <laughs> we do. Yeah. So this is just going to be great. I'm excited. Yeah. <laughs> if, if you do listen to us on the Patreon, um, be sure to have a paper and pen ready for this month's episode because I'm going to give some recipes. Mm -hmm. That's what that's oh. what I'm going to do. I'm excited. <laughs> this show is produced and hosted by myself, Daniel Holland, and the amazing John Lorden. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate or review us on whichever platform you found us on. Have a great month, and we will see you again soon on Crime After Crime.